You know, I can't remember the last time I went into a bank branch to go chat with a teller. Um, I do visit the bank to go to the machines though, right? Maybe I need to go withdraw some cash or put a check in or deposit a check, things like that. So a couple of weeks ago, I did do that. I went to the bank machine to go withdraw some cash. Now, it was a local bank near my house and uh, there was only two machines in the entire facility. So when I got there, both machines happened to be occupied. So I stood back and waited my turn. Um, I ended up waiting some time, actually. I was watching these two individuals they were going about their business, but they, they took a long time. I started getting annoyed. I mean, it doesn't take that long to go take some cash out or put a check in. And so um, I noticed that their body movements of what they were doing and what, uh, what I noticed was there was kind of repetitive. They would put something into the machine and then take it out again, do something, put it into the machine and then take it out again. And the thing that blew my mind is both of these individuals were doing the same thing independently, but they were both putting something into the machine and taking it out. It took me a while to figure it out, but I realized that what they were putting into the machine was those ancient bank books. And then the machine would pull it out again and print out the transaction or print the transactions so they would pull it out again and they would flip the page and put it back into the machine to go print some more transactions. And it blew my mind. I, I couldn't believe that these bank books were still in use. The last time I saw one of those, I, I was 14 years old, I think, and I had just opened up my first checkings account with my parents. My gosh, I, I couldn't believe that even today people are using these bank books. But you know what those bank books are. Those bank books are a record of transactions uh, for your for your banking. The modern equivalent is, well, your online banking portal. You log on to your computer, your banking website, and you're able to view all the transactions, money that's going in and coming out. Regardless as to whether you do it online or the old school paper way, it's still a system of record of your finances. Now, whether you're doing banking or, I don't know, you're in business and you're selling widgets, you still need to have a system of record because you own the dollars in your bank account or you own the widgets that you're working on. And you need to be able to track how many widgets are coming into your warehouse and how many widgets you're selling to your customers. So that way you can manage and maintain your business. You still need a system of record for those widgets. The same thing could be said about the transportation infrastructure that you and I use every day. You know, we, uh, we drive our cars on the roads, we use our bicycles on the cycling facilities, we wait for buses at bus stops. All of that constitutes the infrastructure for our transportation systems. Now, you and I aren't the ones who are actually keeping the system of record for those because we're the users of that system. We collectively own it through our governments. They're the stewards or the ones charged with maintaining that infrastructure. So they're the ones who actually need to maintain a system of record for that transportation infrastructure. Not just any system of record, but a highly detailed system of record that tracks when they acquired it or when they built that piece of infrastructure, when it got sold or when it got disposed of. Its entire life cycle, that piece of infrastructure, how it got better and worse and improved and, and got broken down and repaired and et cetera, et cetera. There's a very detailed system of record that's needed for this type of infrastructure. And our governments are the ones that need to do that, maintain it. And that is exactly what they do. So now think about how you normally interact with a map. You probably do what most of us do, right? You pick up your, your smartphone and you fire up the appropriate app and you take a look at where you are. There's a blue dot that uh, describes where you are on the planet. And normally when you look at that blue dot, it's surrounded by uh, an image, uh, you know, often at times it could be a, a satellite image of perhaps the neighborhood that you're standing in. Uh, or if you're in the car and you're driving, you might see a representation of the road network and maybe you have that dot and it's moving along the road network. Regardless, you're seeing an image around that blue dot that gives you context. Now, it's easy to forget that that image surrounding that blue dot is just that, it's simply an image. I can't interrogate that image to gain more information. It's not like I can tap on uh, on the road that my vehicle's on and get a report of its pavement condition. Or it's not like I can uh, click on a property and pick up its exact address and perhaps the last uh, sale price of that property. None of that's accessible because the image that we see in our common mapping software is simply that, it's an image. And for most uses, that's probably just fine. 
we really only need some spatial orientation to figure out where we are. But for some of us and our businesses, there's need for greater depth of information. We need a little bit more than just an image. We might need to interrogate that underlying infrastructure. I'll give you an example. What if I'm in the business of asset management and I'm managing the transportation infrastructure and I actually need to do an inspection on one of those bridges? I need to tap on that bridge and be able to collect a, a, a report of the historical uh, condition inspections that were done on that bridge. Or perhaps I'm um, doing some emergency response routing and I need to be able to interrogate a piece of infrastructure to make sure that it can actually accommodate a fire truck that I'm going to be, uh, I'm expecting to pass along it. There's a lot of reasons that I have to be able to interrogate some of that infrastructure, but in the common map, that is not available. So all this transportation infrastructure information, it exists. It exists in the system of record that the governments have been creating for decades. They've been busy collecting and managing all of this data at a very detailed level, mind you. The challenge though is that much of that rich data is mostly locked away and inaccessible to the more, I don't know, consumer level mapping tools that are available to us today. And so this is one of my interests. If we're able to devise a way to allow or create a linkage between some of this rich authoritative data and some of the more useful mapping tools that we have around us and are accessible to many of us, well, that opens up a realm of possibilities. I mean, here's a very easy example. Think about Think about a work zone and that work zone, when uh, the city puts in a work zone, they're going to want to have an automatically generated detour list for where the vehicles that would have normally gone through this work zone can go towards and actually take a detour. And that those detours need to be appropriate for the type of vehicles that would have gone through that stretch. And that means that the turn radiuses have to be big enough for large vehicles, et cetera, et cetera. The weights of the, the streets have to be able to accommodate that. There's a lot of factors to take into consideration. And all of that is within the transportation information that I'm talking about. But the disconnect between the, the detour application and that system of record is apparent. We bring those together, suddenly that becomes a reality. Let's talk about something a little bit more futuristic. Maybe, maybe. We might have these autonomous vehicles roaming around our streets, driverless cars, robo-taxis, whatever you want to call them. I think it's important that these vehicles have an up-to-date and accurate information of the entire infrastructure so that they know everything they need to know about that intersection before they arrive there. And now, isn't that the key word, right? If you look at the consumer mapping applications out there, the consumer mapping applications are always being updated after things change on the roadways, after things change in the intersection. I'm sure you've seen on your map where there's an intersection which actually has turned into a traffic circle. But if you look at the map, it's still an intersection, an old school intersection. Well, that is the difference between a consumer level mapping application that has to collect data after the fact versus an authoritative system of record linked mapping system. See, if we can make that link, then we can really open up the possibilities of a tremendous amount of business use cases. And that's what my team is interested in doing. My name is Arif Rafiq. I'm the Transportation Industry Manager at Esri Canada. And we're here to help Canadian municipalities and governments evolve the way they manage their transportation systems.